Welcome back to our study of 2 Kings. We are in 2 Kings chapter 14, and here's what we're going to see in this chapter. Number one, we're going to see a king who's a good king, but who is brought down as a result of his own pride. And then we're going to see a wicked king that God mercifully uses to save his people. And then we're also going to meet a prophet who you are probably familiar with, but who you likely did not expect to meet in this book. So let's dig in to 2 Kings chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the second year of Joash, the son of Joahaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, began to reign. Okay, so a lot of names in there. Amaziah is the new king that we are learning about here in chapter 14. Amaziah, verse 2. <clears throat> he was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. So he had a long reign, right? Verse 3. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did in all things as Joash his father had done. But the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. So he's a good king, right? Verse 3 says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not like David. And uh, one of the things that was um, not ideal, at least, in his reign was that people were still sacrificing on the high places. That could mean anything from their worshiping God, but not where God said they should worship in the temple, or that they are worshiping other gods, worshiping idols. I'm inclined to think at this point um, that they are worshiping God, but not at the temple, right? Uh, both of those, either that option or idolatry, whichever one is happening, they're both wrong, right? They're both not good. Um, so that was going on during Amaziah's reign, but uh, Amaziah was a good king, and we see an example of what made him a good king in verses 5 and 6. It says, And as soon as the royal power was firmly in his hand, he struck down his servants who had struck down the king his father. But he did not put to death the children of the murderers, according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where the Lord commanded, Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers, but each one shall die for his own sin. So uh, what we're being told here is that the, the new king, Amaziah, he is acting in accordance with God's law. And just as God's law says that children should not die for the sins of their fathers, when Amaziah punished those who put to death his father, the king, he didn't punish their children also because that's contrary to what God says in the law. So he's seeking to act in accordance with the law. But he becomes proud. Verse 7 says, He struck down 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt and took Selah by storm and called it Jokthiel, which is its name to this day. So he fought against the Edomites. He struck down 10,000 of them. That's quite a significant victory. And then here's what happens next. Verse 8, Then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us look one another in the face. So Amaziah, king of Judah, sends to uh, Jehoaz, excuse me, Jehoahaz, uh, king of Israel, uh, excuse me, Jehoash, <laughs> too many names there, right? Jehoash, king of Israel, um, and he says, come, let us look one another in the face. Now, uh, that does not mean, hey, let's get together and talk or have coffee or something. This is an invitation to battle, right? So um, he is not just, it is not a friendly invitation, in other words. This is a hostile invitation, and we know that because of how uh, Jehoash responds. All right, verse 9, And Jehoash, king of Israel, sent word to Amaziah, king of Judah, a thistle on Lebanon, sent to a cedar on Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son for a wife. And a wild beast of Lebanon passed by and trampled down the thistle. You have indeed struck down Edom, and your heart has lifted you up. Be content with your glory and stay at home, for why should you provide, me, provoke trouble so that you fall, you and Judah, with you? All right, so uh, Jehoaz... To be Jehoash, it's not the name's fault, it's my fault. Okay, um, Jehoash, sorry about all that. Uh, Jehoash says, um, hey, don't do this, right? You, you are puffed up, right? He says in verse 10, 
You have indeed struck down Edom and your heart has lifted you up. Okay, so you've become proud. And so he says, you're, you're puffed up. You think you're bigger than you are. That's the point of that story with the thistle and the cedar and the beast. All right. Um, the king of Judah is the thistle in that story, right? He's the small one. Um, and he says, you know, you don't want to do this. You don't want to fight me. Stay at home, he says. Right? Because here's what the Bible warns us about. Proverbs 18, 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before, before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Usually we just collapse that, right? Because those two phrases, pride goes before destruction and then a haughty spirit before a fall, those two say the same thing two slightly different ways. We usually collapse them and just say pride goes before a fall. That's what's going to happen to Amaziah. That's what the king of Israel is warning him about. You're puffed up. You're proud. You don't want to fight me. This is not a good idea. But verse 11 says, Amaziah would not listen. So Jehoash, king of Israel, went up, and he and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced one another in battle at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah. And Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his home. And Jehoash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Jehoash, son of Amaziah at Beth Shemesh and came to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem for 400 cubits from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. And he seized all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house, also hostages, and he returned to Samaria. So Amaziah was warned, don't come fight me by the king of Israel. Amaziah wouldn't listen. He fought the king of Israel, and guess what happened? The king of Israel defeated him. In fact, it says he captured him in verse 13. And it says um, that he, the, the king of Israel <clears throat> seized all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord in verse 14. It also says in verse 13 that they uh, broke down the wall of Jerusalem for 400 cubits. A cubit's about 18 inches, so that's way more than 400 feet. And so what happens is Jerusalem is overcome, part of the wall is broken down, and Jerusalem is plundered by Israel. Remember, Israel is uh, an idolatrous uh, people at this point. They are uh, still walking in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the scripture tells us. And so they are uh, not walking with the Lord like they are supposed to. Uh, and when they defeat Jerusalem and plunder it, they are a, um, a picture right, of the coming uh, destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians, who are also idol worshipers. And at the end of 2 Kings, what's going to happen is the Babylonians are going to capture Jerusalem, they're going to destroy the temple, and they are going to plunder it. And we get sort of a miniature version of this early here in chapter 14, where the people of Israel capture the king and uh, defeat Jerusalem and plunder it. So this is a little preview of where things are headed, uh, even for the nation of, of uh, Judah. <clears throat> now, verse 15 says, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoash that he did and his might and how he fought with Amaziah, king of Judah. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jehoash slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. And Jeroboam, his son, reigned in his place. All right, so Jehoash, uh, he dies. Right, And then verse 17, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived 15 years after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel. Now the rest of the deeds of Amaziah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent after him to Lachish and put him to death there. And they brought him on horses, and he was buried in Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. And all the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his father. So both of those kings who were involved in that conflict died, right? Jehoash died and Amaziah died, 
right? And when I said earlier there were too many names, I didn't mean, obviously that's not the Bible's fault, right? So I'm sorry, it's my fault for getting lost. Okay, but now on to the last part. Here's where we're going to see the wicked king and how God mercifully uses that king to say that uh, to save them. And then also we're going to meet a prophet that you might not have expected to meet here. All right, so verse 23, getting close to the end here. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. Now, this is another place where it can get kind of confusing because we've already had a Jeroboam who was king of Israel. In fact, when Israel broke off from Judah after the death of Solomon and the kingdom was divided, Jeroboam was the first king over Israel after it was divided from Judah. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He's come up again and again because he set a pattern of idolatry for Israel uh, that has continued right throughout um, the, uh, the kings who came after him. This is a new Jeroboam. That's why you might have, like I do, you know, you have little titles sometimes in your Bible over little sections. It says Jeroboam the second. That's to remind us or tell us, right, that this is not the same Jeroboam we read about earlier. This is a different Jeroboam, a second Jeroboam, right? He's now king of Israel. Verse 24 says, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. So this is why I said this Jeroboam also is a wicked king because he's continuing to walk in the ways of the earlier Jeroboam and the idolatry that he established for Israel. And it says that he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So he is a wicked king. Nevertheless, God uses this wicked king for good for his people. Notice what happens next. It says, verse 25, he restored the border of Israel from Labo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord of uh, the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. Okay, so it says that he restored the border of Israel, and then it lists you know the location where that happens, and it says that was according to the word of the Lord, and that word of the Lord came through. Jonah. And yes, that is the same Jonah who got swallowed by the fish, who has a, his own book by his own name. The prophet Jonah shows up right here in this book also. Just a little brief mention that reminds us uh, of something significant, which is this. We often think just sort of by, I don't know, habit or assumption or whatever, that whatever we have in the Bible is all there is in terms of what happened or what was said. Uh, but that's definitely not the case. The Bible is very, very condensed, right? And so there's a lot of things that happened and even a lot of things that were said that are not found in the Bible. So when we think of Jonah, we tend to think that what we read in the book Jonah is all that happened to Jonah or all that's important related to Jonah, but it's not. Here's another place where we learn about a prophecy that Jonah made that doesn't seem to have any connection to the, <clears throat> to, to the events of the book of Jonah, at least not on the surface. And yet, uh, this is something that was a part of uh, Jonah's ministry as well, right? And so uh, that's important for us to remember. All right, now let's keep on going. Verse 26, for the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. So he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So God uses Jeroboam, who's doing evil in his sight. He nonetheless uses him, uses that king to deliver, to save his people, right? Because as much as they were guilty of sin, as much as they uh, deserved his judgment to come upon them, he had not said that he would destroy them utterly, the scripture says. And so he rescued them. He delivered them. He did not allow them to be utterly destroyed. Now, finishing up here, verse 28 and 29 says, Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did and his might, how he fought and how he restored Damascus and Hamath to Judah and Israel, 
Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, the kings of Israel, and Zechariah his son reigned in his place. So, two things to take away from that. One is a reminder of the danger of pride. That pride goes before a fall. Uh, pride is our enemy. It is not our friend. Pride is a temptation that we must resist because um, pride can lead us into all kinds of trouble. And so even when God um, does good things in our life and maybe even good things through us and we are uh, then tempted to be puffed up because of that, the scripture reminds us to resist that temptation and to humble ourselves lest after being lifted up we fall. The second thing is to remember that God can work through even wicked people like Jeroboam. Right? God can work through whoever he wants. Right? He will work through uh, the people of Assyria. He will work through the people of Babylon. He will work through Cyrus the Persian. He works through wicked people as well as people who love him and trust him. Now, we obviously, that, that's not a, uh, an endorsement of being wicked, of course. It's just to say this, that God can do what he wants, where he wants, how he wants, through whomever he wants. And so God might do something good for you in your life through someone who's not even a Christian. But it can still be God at work in your life. It can still be God showing his hand, working to bless you, encourage you, or whatever. So don't think that God is limited to only working through those people who are actively following him and trusting him. We, of course, should actively follow and trust him. The Bible is crystal clear about that. Just don't think that God is limited to working through only those people, right? Because he might be at work in some unexpected places, in some unexpected people to do good for you in ways you wouldn't expect, but that God has shown more than once in the Bible that he is willing mercifully to work for the good of his people, even through those who are not seeking to honor him. So that's all we got for chapter 14. God bless.